They are aging members of what was once the most affluent neighborhood in this river town. Here in the 1800s lived the movers and shakers of a city whose potential once seemed greater than that of St. Louis. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. In 1837, heralding a new economic boom, the Wabash and Erie Canals opened. One of the towns expected to benefit the most from this new development was Evansville, Indiana, where the canal connected with the heavily traveled Ohio River. One person attracted by that promise was a Prussian immigrant named John Augustus Wrights, who began a sawmill business, which by 1883 was producing more hardwood lumber than any other mill in the country. That earned him the nickname of the Lumber Baron, and to reflect his growing status, he built a home in this fashionable neighborhood. But unlike the other Victorian homes that line this street, his is the only one that's open to the public. The home's exterior was done in the elegant French Second Empire style, inspired by Napoleon III. It's a highly ornamental style, but also a narrow one, which was well suited for an urban setting. In 1871, John Wrights, his wife, and eight of their ten children moved into this house. But the home visitors see today is very different from what it was like when the family first took up residence. Its look today is all due to the eldest child and a world's fair. After John and his wife passed away, their eldest son, Francis Joseph Wrights, became the head of the household. About the time of the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, it was decided to extensively redecorate the home's interior. Upon entering the house, visitors find themselves in this main hallway, which is decorated with a Moorish flair. It's a style that harkens back to the 8th century, when Islamic invaders captured Spain and their art forms intermingled. Dark walnut wainscoting runs the length of the hallway. On the walls is a heavy flocked covering that once glittered with two shades of gold. Above, the molded frieze covered in gold leaf is in the shape of ancient Arabic script. The theme is repeated in the chandeliers, which are pierced brass with jeweled glass. And the crescent moons, besides being ornamental, also serve as the valve to control the gas to the individual jets. We're in the main hallway which was done in the Moorish style, which was very popular at that time. But its influence did not extend to the other rooms, each of which was done with its own unique character. Just off the hall is the dining room, the largest space in the house. It was mainly used during formal occasions. Soaring 13 feet overhead is the hand-painted canvas ceiling whose pattern matched that of the Aubusson rug that once covered the floor. Two chandeliers imported from Europe are reflected over and over in two large mirrors placed on opposite sides of the room, creating a further feeling of depth. And then there's this mantle, which was originally part of the Tiffany display at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Reportedly, the Wrights paid $15,000 for it and then hired Tiffany workers to install it for them. It was the first item the family purchased for their extensive remodeling project that would completely renovate each room. But not everything was removed. The swags over the windows are made from the original curtain fabric. This parlor set belonged to their father and dates back to 1865 and is still covered by the original fabric. Some of the items in the home are notable for their previous owner. For example, this teakwood cabinet from China was brought to this country by one of the Wright's neighbors, Charles Denby. For 13 years, he had served as the United States Ambassador to China, having been appointed by President Grover Cleveland. And this parlor chair was once owned by Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The Wrights were a deeply religious family who shared their wealth with both the church and the community. In 1931, when the last sibling died, the home was donated to the daughters of Isabella. 
Eventually, it became the home of Evansville's first Catholic bishop. This was the bishop's office. Before that, it had been used as Francis Wright's study and earlier as the family sitting room. In here, the ceiling is covered with a lincrusta paper that was popular at the time as an alternative to expensive plaster work. Stained glass windows adorn several of the rooms. These are set in brass frames and they're hinged so that they can be easily cleaned and to allow more light in. In addition, each panel is backlit so that they can be enjoyed during the evening hours as well. Welcome back to the Wrights home in Evansville, Indiana, which underwent an extensive remodeling just after the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Just how extensive is revealed in an upstairs room. This was the sewing room and it was left pretty much untouched. Here the fireplace is made of cast iron, the floor is regular planking, and the walls were papered. This remnant was recently discovered behind a mirror. But the rest of the house became an elegant show place. Each room has its own unique parquet pattern on the floor along with a distinctive mantle and fireplace. Interesting since the home was converted to steam heat and the fireplaces were for show only. The family lived a quiet life, entertaining only rarely, but when they did, it was with a lavish flair. For dinner parties, guests would gather in this room, which is actually two rooms. At the other end is the family dining room, or breakfast nook, which could be separated from the formal dining area by pocket doors. Above, its hand-painted ceiling features a motif of fruits and foliage. In the formal dining room, this built-in cabinet, also known as a buffet, is one of the dominant features. Each door is accented with leaded glass windows with mirrors behind it to reflect the light, and the walls still have the original silk velvet covering. That covering has a motif of pineapples, which is a symbol of hospitality. It's a theme that's carried in the plaster and stenciling on the ceiling. Below, the mahogany furniture was imported from France, as well as the chandelier that still has its original silk shade. Behind the scenes, things were a little simpler. Cooking was done on a coal stove, and ashes were sent down a chute to be collected in the basement. This was a lockbox in which was stored the expensive spices. The wet pantry sports the latest fad of the 1890s, white tile around the sink. And this is a self-draining oak icebox built into the outside wall. In the back, a door opened so the delivery man didn't have to bring the ice into the house. After his parents died, Francis Wrights moved into the master bedroom, but not before he made a few changes. Due to the lack of closet space, he had the fireplace and mantle removed in order to install this clothes press and dresser. Interestingly, the drawers of his dresser not only pull out, but the fronts also flip down. He needed those pieces because during the restoration, the bedroom closet became the new master bath. Now, in 1891, when the house was built, it was one of the first in Evansville to have indoor plumbing, so there was a shared bath, but Francis wanted his own. Inside, daylight is filtered through a stained glass window. The bathtub is double-walled, allowing water to circulate between the outer and inner walls, keeping the bath water warmer longer. And in the corner is this foot bath. It was probably used more than the bathtub because in those days bathing was still not considered to be a daily event and there was not an unlimited supply of water. Water had to be pumped to a tank on the roof every day. But the Wright's heritage is much more than just this elaborate home for the family always gave back to the community. John Wright's, the lumber baron, built a church for the west side of town and later a home for the aged. Francis Wrights helped build a high school. He brought to town the institution that became Evansville College. 
In 1925, the Pope awarded him the title of Knight of Commander of the Order of Pius IX. He was only the third person in the United States to receive that honor. Today, the home is more than a lavish setting offering a peek into the life of the privileged. Various programs are offered at the site throughout the year, such as mystery fundraisers and Christmas at the Wright's home. Meeting facilities in the carriage house are also available for public use. For more information, the Wright's home can be reached by email at wrights at evansville.net, by phone at 821-426-1871, or log on to their website at www.wrightshome.evansville.net.